of its, uh, of its economy. Now, so there are these three different layers to this uh, conflict and the, the proportions in which these three different uh, layers express themselves at different times are different. Say, for instance, in 2014, the conflict was mainly a civil war between uh, eastern, southeastern Ukraine and western uh, Ukraine, in which the Ukrainian government in Kiev sent the army against its own uh, people in the, in the Donbass. Now, today, that is not the overriding character of this uh, war, although that still exists, but, but the, uh, I would say that the dominant character of this war is an inter-imperialist uh, conflict. Now, uh, as I said, the, the, main, uh, the main subject of this talk is the history of the national question in, in Ukraine, and we know the national question is linked to the national, uh, to the development of the national bourgeoisie, the development of capitalism. Uh, we dismiss this um, idea that's put forward by Ukrainian nationalists and by, by nationalists in all countries that they can trace the history back to, I don't know, a thousand years ago. Re recently, an official Twitter account of the Ukrainian government posted uh, uh, an animated uh, GIF, a little uh, video, where they said that already back in 1899, uh, Ukraine wanted to join the European Union. Uh, I'm, I'm not, it's not a joke, but they, yeah, they trace back the origins, the roots of the Ukrainian nation back to Kiev and Rus and so on. At that time, nations did not exist. National sentiment did not exist. And uh, in fact, the nations, modern uh, nations, are the creation of the bourgeois revolution. And, and here we, we find the first problem. Uh, the bourgeois played a progressive role in creating uh, nation states in its early uh, days through revolutionary means in most uh, cases, unifying the nations in terms of language, but also in terms of a common market, a common system of weights and measures, a common system of tariffs and so on. Uh, and this was the, 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 the historical period of the unification of the uh, ri rise of modern bourgeois nations, France, uh, Britain, uh, Germany later, Italy later, and so on. Uh, Spain never, never completed uh, the, the process in a progressive way. But in the case of Ukraine, Ukraine was under foreign uh, domination up until, uh, in fact, the first time where uh, an independent Ukra modern Ukrainian uh, republic was founded was in 1917. So prior to that, Ukraine was uh, divided between different imperialist powers and it never developed uh, the, its own bourgeois, its own capitalist uh, class. There was capitalist development in uh, Ukraine in the 19th century beginning of the 20th century, but it was uh, mainly foreign capital, French, British capital. They invested particularly in the Donbass, in uh, steel industry, in the mining and so on, and in the big uh, cities. Uh, and this was at a time when, as I say, Ukraine was, was divided between different imperialist uh, powers. Now, Ukraine is mostly a flat land in uh, Central uh, Europe and, and Ukraine, Poland. This is, is mostly flat land and, and, and as a result, between Europe and Asia. And as a result of this, this has been the, the place of uh, mass migrations, invasions by different uh, empires coming from Asia or coming from uh, Europe, moving eastwards or, or westwards and some, uh, some uh, northwards and so on. And, and uh, different parts of Ukraine have been in different times of history and the different types of foreign domination, for instance, the Crimean Khanate under the, the domination of the Turkish Ottoman uh, Empire was, was, uh, was an important part of, uh, of southern uh, uh, Ukraine. And determine uh, all these different invasions have uh, determined to this day the, the national character, the, the slightly different national characteristics of different regions of, of modern day Ukraine. Modern day Ukraine, you could say, is a patchwork of different uh, uh, regions that, that, uh, that are put, to, uh, put, put together. You have, for instance, uh, Bukovina and Transcarpatia, in, uh, which are part of Western Ukraine, but they have a completely different character than, than uh, Volhynia and Galicia, also in Western Ukraine, which are the main site of, of uh, Ukrainian uh, nationalism, because they were dominated by uh, Moldova, Romania, and, uh, and uh, and Hungary, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and so on, at different times of the... That's why I'm saying these maps are quite, quite complicated, if you can get your head around, uh, around this. And then there is... Uh, but, but the basic division of Ukraine, you could say, is the division between Western Ukraine, i.e. the regions uh, of uh, Galicia and uh, Volhynia, 
which were one time part of the, of the Polish-Lithuanian uh, 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 regime. Uh, and for quite a long time, they, they've been part of, uh, of uh, and under the domination of Western uh, uh, empires, including uh, Poland and so on. And then you have Eastern and Southeastern uh, Ukraine, which has been uh, for a longer period of time under the domination of the Russian uh, Tsarist uh, Empire. And in between, there is, uh, which uh, is based around Kharkiv and, uh, and the whole area around the, the Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk, and uh, going all the way down to uh, Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kherson, uh, all the places that now have been invaded by, by Russia or under threat of Russian uh, invasion. And, um, and, and this division, you can, you can see that uh, it seeps through even to, to today's politics in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. It was in Western Ukraine that uh, Ukrainian nationalism first uh, emerged, Ukrainian national uh, uh, identity uh, during, the, during the 19th uh, century. And this was because uh, that region, that part of Ukraine was under the domination of the Austro-Hungarian Empire where there was uh, a, a policy of uh, national cultural auton autonomy. Each people had their own uh, schools in their own languages and so on. This allowed uh, certain room for the development of the Ukrainian uh, language, the Ukrainian uh, nation. Around mainly, th this area was also very peasant, agricultural, rural uh, based. So it was mainly uh, peasants who spoke uh, the Ukrainian uh, language. And, uh, and here is where, where the main uh, the intellectuals of, of early nationalism, like Taras Shevchenko, the, the, the national poet, uh, rose, developed, uh, codified the, the language, and, and created a, a, a national uh, identity for, for Ukraine, while the language was completely banned in the areas of Ukraine that were under domination of the Russian uh, Empire. Russia was uh, the Tsarist Empire was a jailhouse of nations, as, as Lenin uh, explained, and all uh, minority uh, languages, although uh, the great Russians represented only about 45% of the total population, but, but all other languages were banned. And the Tsarist Empire used very skillfully the national question, the, op the national oppression, as a way of staying in power, and also anti-Semitism. Ukraine was the site of uh, a long history of anti-Semitic uh, pogroms. But in reality, the composition of the population was a bit peculiar because Ukrainian-speaking population was mainly concentrated in the countryside amongst the peasants, while in the cities, there were also Ukrainian speakers in the cities, but in the cities, the workers and also the, the, the urban petty bourgeois were mainly great Russians, Russian-speaking, and uh, Jewish, and uh, Poles. Uh, so that, that created a, a division. There was always the tendency of thinking that the, the Ukrainian nationalism was a backward peasant uh, uh, ideology and that the, there was uh, certainly an element of uh, great Russian chauvinism amongst the, the workers in the, in the cities. They didn't understand the national question or, or these people who spoke this other language. They were separate from them. They didn't come into regular contact, uh, into regular contact uh, with. And there was never a bourgeois, the development of a national uh, bourgeois. Um, for this reason, this was a complicated uh, situation. Having a, a, a correct policy uh, on, on two questions, on the question of uh, the land, i.e. agrarian uh, reform, and on the question of uh, language and national uh, rights was very important for the workers' movement in the Russian uh, Empire to be able to succeed. Uh, and this was very early uh, recognized by Lenin and, uh, and the Bolsheviks and the, the 1903 Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, which was the name of the Marxist party at that time. They adopted a program which included in point nine uh, a point about the national question. And they basically said that uh, they were in favor of the right of nations to self-determination up and to up and up to and including independence, if they so uh, wished. And uh, also they were in favor of the greatest autonomy and language rights for national uh, minorities. But at the same time that they said this, which is, which is correct, they also said that they were in favor of the unity of the working class party, the unity of the Marxist party across the different national uh, uh, groups. So there was one Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, which covered the whole territory of the Russian uh, Tsarist uh, Empire. 
But this was not an easy discussion. This was Lenin's position, which was adopted by the Congress in 1903, but this was not the position of all uh, Bolsheviks, of all Marxists at that time. Very famously, Rosa Luxemburg, who was a Polish uh, uh, Marxist, and obviously very close to this question in, in Ukraine, uh, adopted uh, the opposite position. She said uh, that, that, that she, she had a very strong anti nationalist uh, position, which was correct for, for, a, for a Polish uh, Marxist, opposition to the Polish, uh, the, the leaders of the Polish national uh, movement were, were reactionary. But at the same time, this, this uh, in her case, this, this uh, went too far. And she said that the Russian Marxists could not adopt the position of the national self-determination for the oppressed nationalities because this will help the bourgeois uh, the petty bourgeois and, and uh, the landlords that were using the national question in Poland and in other nationalities. And she was wrong on this. She was wrong. And had the party adopted that policy, it's doubtful whether they will have carried out a successful uh, Russian revolution in 1917. But there were others. There, there were others like Bukharin, Piatakov, who was Ukrainian uh, himself, Radek, who were also against this uh, Lenin's policy on the national question. And their argument was which they maintained all the way up until 1919 and after the Russian Revolution, they said the national question, national self-determination is utopian under capitalism in the epoch of imperialism. There can be the formation of, uh, the, the formation of new nations is not possible. Therefore, this is a, sl a utopian slogan. And under socialism, it will be redundant because there will be the, the, the fraternity of all workers uh, regardless of uh, nations. So they were against this uh, policy. We, we will see that this played a negative role later on in, in Ukraine. Now, uh, as I said, the first time that the Ukrainian uh, uh, independent or autonomous authority was created was in, in uh, 1917, after the February Revolution in Russia. February Revolution in Russia, in which, by the way, the taking over of power in Petrograd, uh, Ukrainians played uh, an important uh, uh, role. They uh, Obviously, the overthrow of uh, Tsarist Empire gave rise to all the, the national uh, movement and, and so on in all the different uh, republics. And then you had the creation of the central Rada uh, government in Ukraine and also the creation of Soviets, Soviets of workers, peasants, soldiers in uh, Ukraine. The Bolsheviks participated in the Rada, though they were in a minority. And very soon there was a conflict. There was a conflict emerged between the central Rada, which was mainly based in Western uh, Ukraine, and uh, the Soviets, they had two completely different uh, policies. In fact, the Central Rada, which was dominated by bourgeois nationalists and petty bourgeois elements, refused to give land to the peasants. The, this was the crucial uh, question, in one of the crucial questions in the revolution in Russia and in Ukraine. And so progressively uh, was losing support amongst its own uh, basis of support that it originally uh, had. Uh, the October Revolution, was uh, truthful to its word, and one of the first acts of the, of the new revolutionary Soviet government was to recognize the independence, national self-determination of all the oppressed uh, uh, nations. Even if that meant, at that time, handing over these countries, uh, Lithuania, Georgia, Ukraine, and others, handing over these countries to petty bourgeois uh, nationalist uh, elements, in some cases uh, in the form of Mensheviks, in some other cases of petty bourgeois elements, bourgeois nationalists, who were against Soviet power. But it was important for, for the Soviet uh, power in, uh, in Petrograd and in, in, uh, in Moscow to send a clear signal that they had nothing to do with the Tsarist Empire, with the oppression of great uh, Russian uh, imperialism, and that they were for the, for the freedom of the nations. This was the only basis on, on which they could then wage a, a, a campaign to win, over, to win over these republics to Bolshevism uh, and to win a majority for the workers and peasants councils in, this, uh, in these uh, regions. Now, uh, but immediately there were problems. The, 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 the declaration of independence of Ukraine was, was uh, under, under a, a republic called the, the, the Ukrainian National Republic, the UNR. And uh, immediately, very shortly after, after uh, its declaration of independence in, in mid-November 1917, uh, um, the Ukrainian National Republic allowed a Cossack reactionary army to march through its territory 
in order to go and smash Soviet power in the south uh, east, in, in the Donbas uh, mainly, where the Soviets were based on the, on the mining uh, proletariat. This led the Soviet government in, uh, in uh, Moscow to declare war on the Ukrainian National Republic, and it was the beginning of a, of a, of a civil war. It was, it was a, 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 a war that had two different uh, aspects to it, the, the invasion of the Red Army, if you want, but also the invasion of the Red Army was based on the uprising of the workers and peasants in uh, Kiev, in Kharkiv, uh, in all the big cities and industrial centers, centers in, uh, in Ukraine. So this was, again, uh, a civil war uh, between black and white, if you want, and also the intervention of, uh, of the Soviet uh, Russia in, in this. Um, this was then further co the, the, the Soviets, the, the Ukrainian Soviets and the Red Army were in the, in the winning uh, side, but, by, but, but then this was then further complicated by the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Uh, this was the, the peace negotiations between Germany, uh, between Germany and, uh, and uh, the Soviet government in, in Russia. And what uh, they were forced by the German advance, I, Trotsky had a policy of no war, no peace. He wanted to delay the negotiations so that the, the, the Soviets were able to make an appeal to the revolutionary masses in uh, Germany, trigger a German revolution, and then be able not to have to sign any, any peace in, in detrimental terms with Germany. But this didn't happen. The German, uh, or didn't happen at that time in, in the spring of 1918. The German high command obviously wasn't stupid. They realized what the, what the Soviets were doing and then they decided to advance. While they were still talk, talking in brest they decided to advance and they took, uh, they took over quite a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Ukraine and they forced uh, settlement, the brest uh, agreement in, by which uh, Soviet Russia was handing over large parts of the, the majority of Ukraine. So ma the majority of Ukraine was for a period of few months and the German, uh, uh, and the German, uh, an, uh, an Austro-Hungarian uh, domination, and the, the Red Army was pushed uh, back. Uh, so I'm just saying, this, this then gave rise to, uh, then in November 1918, there was a German revolution. The, the Soviets then said, well, the, the brest agreement is finished, and then they decided to intervene in Ukraine uh, again. And then there was the beginning of a civil war that lasted for two or three uh, years that was extremely complicated. Uh, it wasn't just two sides, there were, I don't know, 25 different uh, sides. There was, uh, there was a part of that civil war, which was a Ukrainian-Polish uh, war in Western uh, Ukraine. There was, a, there was uh, also the Ukrainian uh, National uh, Republic, which allied itself with German and Austro-Hungarian uh, imperialism. Then there was the war between the whites, i.e. the counter-revolutionaries, and the reds, i.e. the Soviet uh, government, which was also taking place in uh, the territory of uh, Ukraine, which was one of the bases of, of counter-revolution, the Denikin uh, armies and so on. Then there was the, the, the Magnoite, um, I hesitate to call them anarchists, but the, the Magnoite peasant uh, armies, that they were doing their, their own thing, sometimes allied with the reds, sometimes allied with, uh, with the whites. In the middle of all this, there was the, the formation of the Hetmanate, which was a Ukrainian uh, authority, a Ukrainian dictatorship that was allied to, uh, to Western uh, imperialism. 1.5 million people died, and uh, many cities changed sites many times. There were massacres and so on. And during this war, there were also massive anti-Semitic uh, uh, pogroms committed by all uh, sides, with, with the exception of the, of the, of the, Red, uh, of the Red Army. And what this demonstrated, this period of extreme uh, turmoil and confusion, what this demonstrated is that uh, something that then, then was, was ratified in the Second World War, there, there was no room in these republics, not in Ukraine, not in Georgia, not in uh, Poland, not any, any, in any of these uh, newly independent countries, there was no room for a halfway, properly independent, sovereign, bourgeois democratic country. It, it, there were only two alternatives, either domination by Western uh, imperialism and a dictatorship, a ferocious uh, dictatorship in this case, or Soviet power, i.e. the workers and peasants coming to power. There was no middle way. Any attempt at national uh, independence was completely crushed by, by uh, the circumstances. Uh, it was at this point, I think it was at the end of, at the end of, um, at the end of, uh, at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, um, 1919, 
beginning of uh, 1920 that Lenin, uh, on the back of the advance of the, of the Red Army into Ukraine, made a very famous speech, which is called a letter, letter to the workers and peasants of Ukraine. I, uh, it's on the website. I recommend comrades to read it. It's quite a long document, but it's very, it exposes, explains Lenin's uh, policy on the national question, which was extremely careful and was designed to do two things. One, to convince the Ukrainian workers and peasants that the Red Army had nothing to do with Tsarist uh, nationalism uh, and, and that uh, Ukraine was independent. The Soviet power had the, the recognized the independence of Ukraine and the, the Ukrainian workers and peasants had to decide their own future, whether they wanted a completely independent country, an independent country that was federated with uh, Russia in different degrees, a confederation, or a complete am amalgamation. But that was not for the Russian uh, Marxist or workers to decide. It was for the Ukrainian workers and peasants to decide. And in this uh, letter, he says, he's extremely very careful, he says, we want unity, but we want a voluntary unity. Uh, and, and we recognize that such a union cannot be affected at one stroke. We have to work towards it with the greatest patience so as not to spoil matters and not to arouse distrust. And so that the distrust inherited from centuries of landowner and capitalist oppression, centuries, centuries, private property and the enmity, en en enmity caused by its divisions and redivisions may have a chance to wear off. This was Lenin's uh, policy. But here Lenin was not just addressing the Ukrainian workers and peasants, he was addressing the Ukrainian uh, Bolsheviks who had a wrong position on this question. The first head of Soviet power in uh, Ukraine, unfortunately, was Pyatakov, who was a Ukrainian uh, Bolshevik, an old Bolshevik, but he had a completely wrong position. He, he had an ultra-left position, and he argued for this in, in the party, and he said what I said before, that the uh, Ukrainian, uh, that the, the national self-determination is a utopian, is utopian under capitalism in the epoch of imperialism, and it's uh, redundant under socialism. So he said, look, we already have socialism, we have Soviet power, and therefore, there should be no talk of uh, nationalism or anything like this. Th this was his wish, but nationalism did exist and played a big role. And, and as Lenin explained, centuries of oppression and uh, grievances and so on uh, ha had a big impact in the psychology of the masses in Ukraine, particularly of the peasants. And at that time, you couldn't have a revolution in, uh, successful revolution in Ukraine without winning over the, peas the peasantry. That's, that's quite clear. Uh, Lenin's policy actually was, uh, and then the second head of uh, Soviet power in Ukraine was Rakovsky, the, the Balkan internationalist. But he also had a wrong position on Ukraine. In fact, his position was that Ukrainian nationalism didn't exist, that it was uh, an, an invention of a few intellectuals that, hadn't, uh, that you didn't have to take into account. This, this created uh, lots of problems and aggravated the situation in, in Ukraine. Uh, he, to his credit, he then later, in 1921 changed his position and came, came to Lenin's point, point of view. Lenin's very careful position allowed the Bolsheviks to win over uh, a section of the left social revolutionaries in Ukraine, which was a mainly a peasant uh, party. This peasant party in Russia had risen up in, 20, in, uh, in 1918 against Soviet power, but in uh, Ukraine joined united, fused with the Bolshevik uh, party to create a united communist uh, party. And Lenin said, we have differences. Some, some of the, there were differences amongst the Ukrainian communists about the question of whether Ukraine should be independent or not, about whether the party should be independent and, and affiliate directly to the Comintern and things like this. He said, let's not allow these secondary questions to divide us. We're all fighting. Uh, for workers' uh, power against the capitalists, the landowners, and Western imperialism. Let's unite on that basis. The, all the other technical questions of the, the limitation of borders, the, 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 federa the, the degree of federation, and all that, we can discuss uh, later on over, over time in a patient uh, way. And he said something. My, my time is not, uh, time is against me, but I, I will quote this because I think it's a very important uh, quote. He said, thank you. He said, if, great Russia, if a great Russian communist insists upon the amalgamation of the Ukraine with Russia, Ukrainians might easily suspect him of advocating this policy, not from the motive of uniting the proletarians in the fight against capital, but because of prejudices of the old great Russian nationalism of imperialism. Such mistrust is natural 
and to a certain degree inevitable and legitimate, Lenin says. So Lenin is warning the great Russian uh, communists to be careful uh, because of history. Uh, but then he says, if a Ukrainian communist insists upon the unconditional state independence of Ukraine, he lays himself open to the suspicion that he's supporting this policy not because of the temporary interest of the Ukrainian workers and peasants in the struggle against capital, but on account of petty bourgeois national prejudices of the small, of the small owner. So he's, he's attacking both the, 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 the danger of uh, nationalist prejudices on the part of the great Russian uh, nationalists, but also on the part of the Ukrainian uh, nationalists. It's very interesting. Says, Consequently, we, we great Russian communists must repress with the utmost severity the slightest manifestation in our midst of great Russian nationalism. And uh, you can see clearly that, uh, that, uh, that this is not just a letter to Ukrainian workers and peasants. This is a letter to his own uh, party members in, uh, in Ukraine who had the wrong policy on this uh, question. And this was to come up again in 1922. 1922 was the, was, the, was the founding of the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics. Prior to this, there was the Russian Socialist Federate, Federative uh, Republic and all the other different uh, republics. In, in, in 1922 was the formation of the USSR. And uh, here there was a conflict between Lenin and Stalin. Stalin was the commissar for nationalities and he uh, bungled the whole situation everywhere in Georgia, in uh, Ukraine, everywhere in Poland. And his uh, position, Stalin's position was, we have the Russian Socialist uh, um, Federative, so what's this, uh, Russian Socialist Soviet Federative Republic and all the other republics should amalgamate with it. They should just join, join the Russian uh, Republic. And Lenin said, no, we can't have that. And he, he produced an amendment to the statutes of the Constitution of the Soviet Union. He said, this is a, is a voluntary union amongst equals, i.e. The, um, the Transcaucasian Federation, the Ukrainian uh, re Socialist uh, Republic and the Russian Socialist Re Republic, they unite on equal terms with the right of any of the component parts to separate if they so wish. And the Constitution of the Soviet Union said this until, until the overthrow of the Soviet Union. This was Lenin against Stalin with the support of Rakovsky, who by this time had changed his, uh, his position. And this was very important for, for Lenin because it, it revealed uh, it's a very careful approach to the, national, uh, to the national question. Now, this was followed then by a policy which was known as indigenization, Koryatsania. And uh, this policy consisted in the promotion of the national languages, the national culture in all of these regions. Because there was this problem that uh, the, 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 the leading uh, layers of the communist parties in all the different uh, nationalities was composed mainly of great uh, Russians and uh, not of the, of the of, uh, of communists from that nationality. So this was uh, promoted. There was, a, there was a, a leader of the Ukrainian Communist Party called Mikola Skripnik and he was the secretary of the party and he, promoted, he, he was also an intellectual and he, he played a role in uh, codifying the language but uh, Ukrainian became the, langu the medium language in schools he was promoted through culture and so on. The level, the, the degree, the, the, the percentage of people who could speak Ukrainian massively increased. The number of Ukrainian, uh, ethnic Ukrainians in the party increased in percentage. And also, this was not just a cultural policy, it was accompanied by an economic policy. As Ukraine developed economically through Soviet uh, power, uh, the peasants left the land and uh, moved on to the cities, they joined the factories. And, and uh, Ukrainian language came into the came to be more prominent in the in the working class. Uh, however, however, uh, this was not to last uh, because Stalin came after Lenin, and he broke with all these uh, policies. He took power uh, and destroyed uh, basic uh, Leninism. The rise of the bureaucracy to power also destroyed the national policy of uh, of uh, Lenin and basically implemented a national policy which was completely uh, the opposite. By 1928, uh, the, the, the bureaucracy, uh, the Stalinist bureaucracy was completely uh, afraid of what was happening in the country and took an ultra-left uh, ultra uh, turn and attacking the peasants 
and then also attacking the, the, the nationalities and, and they started seeing nationalist deviations uh, everywhere. They reversed the policy and they implemented the policy of national uh, chauvinism. In fact, Lenin had described, if I can find it, Lenin had described, what is it? Had described uh, Stalin's approach, can't find it. He said uh, something to the effect that Stalin's approach was an was approach of a, of a great Russian imperialist. And uh, he did implement this uh, policy. Mikola Skripnik was uh, purged in the purges in the 1930s. And then on top of this, this policy was accompanied, and this is important for Ukraine, with forced collectivization. And uh, forced collectivization created a massive uh, disaster in the, in the countryside, and particularly in the, in the peasant uh, grain producing uh, regions, chiefly amongst them, Ukraine, but not just Ukraine. Uh, today, the Ukrainian nationalists say this was a policy designed to create a genocide of the Ukrainian uh, people. But in fact, this policy created mass famine everywhere in, uh, in, uh, in other grain-producing regions in Russia, which had in Kazakhstan nothing to do with, uh, with Ukraine. Although it's true that in Ukraine, the policy of the bureaucracy was uh, not only just a bureaucratic policy, but it was also a great Russian uh, nationalist uh, policy. The two things overlapped uh, each other. Not only this, but then the, the purges in the 1930s affected particularly Ukraine. And if you read this book by Pierre Brouet, The Communists uh, Under Stalin, you can see, which is not available in English, unfortunately. You can, you can read it in you know, Italian, Spanish, French. Uh, it should be translated at some point. But, but you can see how the left opposition, the Trotskyist opposition, was particularly strong in Ukraine, in the big factories, amongst the youth, uh, not, 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 for, uh, not, for, not, 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 not uh, by coincidence. Um, so this created a situation which uh, gave rise to uh, the, the ideas of Ukrainian nationalism became uh, uh, popular again. And uh, Soviet power was seen by a section of the population as not only as a bureaucratic power, but also as a foreign uh, Russian nationalist uh, oppression of the Ukrainian uh, of the Ukrainian people. And here we have the rise of the organization of Ukrainian uh, nationalists own uh, in the late 1920s. And this, this is a fascist organization, Ukrainian nationalist uh, organization, which is based on fascist uh, ideas of creating an ethnically pure uh, Ukraine and fighting against uh, Soviet uh, power, fighting against communism, against Bolshevism. It was extremely reactionary organization, but which, which uh, uh, gain quite a lot of support in Western uh, Ukraine on the basis of this, uh, or helped, let's say, by, by the really stupid policies, uh, Russian nationalist policies of the Stalinist uh, bureaucracy. But this, uh, make, make no mistake about this, this is a fascist organization. They themselves say, we are fascists, we model ourselves on Mussolini and the fascist dictatorships in Central Europe and so on. And then, later on, when it became fashionable, it became also a Nazi organization, uh, a pro-German uh, National Socialist uh, or organization. And, um, and in fact, uh, and, and then this comes the next, the next part of this uh, for formation of the national identity of Ukraine, which is very important today, which is the Second World War. And the Second World War was mainly, of course, a, a war uh, in, in Ukraine, mainly a war between the Red Army, uh, the Soviet Union, and Nazi Germany, and uh, the OWN took a position led by uh, people like Stefan Bandera, Yushevich, and others. They took a position of collaborating with the Nazis. Not, not just collaborating with the Nazis, the, the idea was we're going to declare an independent Ukraine, independent fascist Ukraine. We're going to call on the Nazis to support themselves on us here. We're going to be the representatives of Nazi Germany and the Nazi ideology. In, uh, in, and, and Hitler had given some hints that he, he will be in favor of something like that. Um, um, uh, and uh, the, the Nazis were able to raise a, a volunteer division in Galicia, the SS Galicia, a uh, volunteer division of the SS troops uh, amongst uh, the Galician uh, peasants uh, and, and Ukrainian uh, nationalists. This, this reactionary Ukrainian uh, nationalism allied Again, like in the 1920s, with uh, powers to its west, a, a Western imperialist uh, powers. Not, not in the sense that we understand today, but, but in this case, with Germany, uh, a powers that came from that side. Now, Jesus. <laughs> now, this is, um, this is far, but I'll, I'll spend a bit more time on this, on this question before I jump. 
because th this is very important. In 1939, as you know, there was the, the Hitler-Stalin uh, pact, and they divided uh, Poland, uh, the, 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 the division of Poland between Germany and uh, Soviet uh, Union, and Stalin's uh, Russia, meant also the, the occupation, uh, the partition of Poland meant also the, the Red Army occupation of Galicia and Volhynia, which had up until that time been part of, uh, of uh, Poland. And uh, th this was also an important uh, part of this, of this, of this question of the, of the own, of the formation of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. And also then they raised an armed wing, which was the Ukrainian insurgent uh, uh, army, which was a bit wider than the own itself, but was fighting on the side of the, of the Nazis. And they, in the periods when they were in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, power or in a position to, to do so, they carried out massive uh, pogroms of Jews, but also and mainly of Poles. Uh, their, their idea was that we need to ethnically, cl ethnically cleanse the whole of Western uh, Ukraine from uh, Poles. Remember that this, this area had been under Polish domination for, for a very long time and it was a multinational uh, uh, region. And uh, tens of thousands of Poles were massacred in the most brutal way. In fact, they, they were the, the shock troops for Nazi Germany, and they carried out the most dirty uh, work for the, for the Nazis, particularly in 41-43, which is the period of uh, German occupation. Now, by, uh, by a quirk of uh, history, in the end, Hitler was not in favor of this idea of an independent uh, Ukraine, and the Ukrainian Nazis who wanted uh, them to be recognized by uh, Germany were left without the, the recognition. But they, this didn't stop their, col their collaboration. Some of them were arrested by the, by the Nazis, like Stephen Bandera, but they were kept in uh, good conditions, in, uh, in special quarters in the, in the concentration camp. And the collaboration continued, even in the period where the UPA, uh, insurgent army, was allegedly also fighting the, the, the Nazis. And uh, lots of the, the cadres of the OWN and the UPA were trained by the Germans. And then when the Germans uh, entered again, they, they were the shock troops for, for them in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. But of, of course, this is just one side of the story. Millions of Ukrainians from all parts of the country uh, participated in the Red Army struggle against Nazi Germany. Uh, and, and, and this is, is part of the historical uh, uh, memory, the, the banner of the victory, the victory day, and all, all of that is part of the historical uh, memory of, uh, of millions of, of Ukrainians uh, today. And millions died. Uh, Ukraine is the country which had the largest proportion of population killed during uh, World War II, and wh where one, some of the most important battles took, uh, took place. Now, you fast forward, to 1989 and 91, there was the collapse of the Soviet uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, the restoration of capitalism, which was a complete disaster from the point of view of uh, the Eastern countries, but particularly in Ukraine. Ukrainian population went down from I think 52 million to 45 million in the space of 10 years uh, because of the increase in uh, mortality, mass migration, and, and so on. The whole destruction of culture and everything, and the creation of a really rotten regime based on oligarchs. And these oligarchs adopted this division of the country. Some oligarchs were Western Ukraine based, based more liberal and pro-European Union, i.e. pro-West. And some other oligarchs were more pro-based in the East and pro-Russian, pro-Eastern. But they, they didn't really care much about this. All they cared was about the loot and they settled affairs amongst themselves through, a uh, through assassinations and, and so on, but they used this. And you can see in the hist political history of Ukraine since 1991, there's a clear division of the country between the East and the, and the West. The East votes for the party of the regions, the West votes for other parties that are close or, or pro-European, pro pro-Western pro uh, parties. And this division reflects and replicates the divisions that have uh, existed historically in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and then, this obviously was, uh, uh, th there was an attempt, a section of the oligarchic uh, capitalist class in Ukraine to build a uh, Ukrainian national identity based on just half of the country, or one side of the country. A reactionary Ukrainian uh, nationalism. Not all Ukrainian nationalism is reactionary, but this particular brand of Ukrainian nationalism, which is references itself 
on the organization of Ukrainian nationalism, nationalists, Stevan Bandera, the Ukrainian insurgent army, is reactionary. And not, not only reactionary, but alienates a third or half of the, of the country that has completely different uh, points of, uh, of reference and can only lead to the breakup of the country. This reactionary nationalism destroys the U Ukraine. That's it. Uh, and this we can see very, very, clear, uh, very clearly after the Maidan. Th this process was strength strengthened after the Maidan uh, uh, takeover in 2014 when uh, uh, the new rulers in, in Kiev uh, adopted a whole series of measures against the Ukrainian uh, language, in, uh, sorry, against the Russian language in education, in the media, but also uh, the glorification of uh, Stevan Bandera, the Ukrainian uh, insurgent army, they, there was a law that declared them uh, the heroes of the national liberation of uh, Ukraine. Uh, it is now banned in Ukraine to criticize them. This is a, a criminal uh, act and, uh, and so on and so, and so, and so forth. Uh, there's the Stevan Bandera streets and monuments and uh, even, I mean, this, this is not just uh, back in 2014, up, up until uh, just a few days ago was the 14th of October. The day, the day of the defender of Ukraine, installed by, by Poroshenko in 2015. And uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, gave a medal to a guy who was a, who was a veteran from, from the Ukrainian insurgent uh, army who was involved in the, in the ethnic cleansing of Poles during, the, during World War II. This guy is, is 99 now. But why, why did he need to have to, to make this, this uh, gesture? Well, quite clearly to, to appeal to this, uh, to this uh, layer and to appeal to this uh, nation, building of a national identity based on this reactionary Ukrainian nationalism. Now, some uh, Ukrainian communists that I've spoken to, they, say, they, say, they explain it in the following way, and they're not wrong. They say, Lenin created Ukraine, and the Ukrainian nationalists have destroyed the, the country. And this is true. Uh, it, it was Lenin's policy that allowed for the, for the creation of the first uh, UK independent Ukrainian republic that has uh, ever existed, or existed in the modern, modern times. And it's the Ukrainian nationalists, Ukrainian reactionary nationalists, which have split and destroyed the, the country. Because, of course, the Maidan movement in 2014 uh, had a counter-reaction. People who didn't like Stevan Bandera, who didn't like this, uh, these national heroes, they rose up didn't like the, the national rights being trampled uh, upon, they, they rose up. And uh, there was no talk in the West at that time about national sovereignty, the national rights of, of the Russian-speaking uh, people, people in the Donbas and the Donetsk and Odessa and other places, who were massacred as well, against whom uh, uh, the army was sent in the anti-terrorist uh, operation. And then there was another important point at that time, which is that because when the army arrived in places like Slavyansk, Kramatorsk and so on. There's videos from that time in the Western bourgeois media was reported. And they found that instead of Russian invaders, what they found was the local <laughs> population, who started talking to them, blockading the tanks, and then they, they said, well, we're not gonna fight against these uh, people. And the Ukrainian state had no other recourse, or had no other better idea, than to raise volunteer battalions, mainly from, a f from amongst the far-right neo-Nazi, uh, uh, nationalists to carry out this, this, and this is the origins of the Azov uh, battalion. Uh, and, and this is the situation that, that, that led to a civil war in, uh, in Ukraine, in which, of course, Russia took advantage and, and intervened. But that was not uh, the origins. Uh, Russia took advantage of that and intervened. But, uh, but that was a very, very much a, a homegrown conflict in, in Ukraine between two, two sides of the, of, the, of the population. And so, just coming to uh, <laughs> just, uh, 50 minutes. Just coming to an end. I'll just uh, I'll just like to say two two more things. One one is that uh, oh by the way this is not just what this Ukraine uh, Lenin created Ukraine. Ukrainian nationalists have destroyed it. It's not just something that uh, Ukrainian communists say, but uh, also Putin said this. Didn't he say this when when he uh, was announcing the invasion? He said. Well, you, you want uh, de decommunization. Well, let's go all the way because, uh, because Ukraine is a, is a communist Bolshevik uh, creation of uh, Lenin, which will have never existed, he said. <laughs> this is his position, but he's not wrong on the facts. 
he's not wrong on the facts. The, the, the Ukrainian uh, in, in the independent uh, sovereign republic could only exist because of Soviet power in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, because of the Bolshevik uh, revolution. She said, so you don't want communism? Well, let's, let's, let's do away with all of it. Let's go to, uh, to the situation prior when the Russian Empire controlled uh, the country. And what, so what is the, uh, and then Zelensky, in fact, this is ironic because Zelensky tried to move away from this division of the country. He was elected on the basis of uh, making, uh, uh, implementing the peace uh, agreements, reintegrating the Donbas into uh, Ukraine. And uh, in fact, th this is a bit funny, but he tried to look for other national identity symbols. He said, if we reference ourselves to things that happened in the Second World War, we're going to be split. He is right. Um, so the new national uh, symbol of Ukraine is going to be the borscht, the, the, the Ukrainian national soup, yeah. and uh, this you will unite all Ukrainians, then other people say, no, borscht is not really Ukrainian. <laughs> but anyway, this was his attempt to do this, and, uh, and he was completely opposed by the far right. They created the no surrender, what's it called, the no surrender coordinating committee, something like this, and, uh, and they basically faced him even arms in hand, these are the people who have been armed by the state, and uh, he, he, he basically gave in to, to them in the, in the, in the end, they, uh, the, the monster they, they themselves had created. So what is the position that uh, Marxists, revolutionaries internationally should take on this conflict now, having understood what's the, what's the background to, to this? Well, first of all, uh, I mean, I will say that the, the clear model is the position that the Marxists took in uh, the First World War, the position of Livneck, and uh, Lenin, the main enemy of the working class, is at home. This means that we here in Britain, we have a warmongering uh, uh, government. All of them have gone, uh, Liz Truss, Ben Wallace, uh, Boris Johnson several times. They've all uh, gone to Kiev, show support more uh, and supporting this uh, war because they see this as a war against Russia, an opportunity to weaken uh, Russia. So our main enemy is our own ruling class. And so therefore we are against Western imperialism. We are against the imperialist warmongering of our own uh, uh, government. We cut across through the fog of uh, lies and we link the foreign policy with the home policy. Same government is spending millions and billions in propping up this uh, regime in Kiev. Now tell me, uh, how much sovereign is uh, the, the government in Kiev when it's, uh, the wages of its uh, civil servants are paid by Washington and, uh, and London and Brussels. This is no sovereignty uh, at all in that. Uh, when its army is trained in, uh, in Britain, 10,000 soldiers have already, uh, Ukraine soldiers, been trained here when its ammunition come from the West, when its uh, satellite imaginary, imaginary comes from the West, when its intelligence comes from the West, the coordination of the operation. I mean, this, this is a colony of uh, NATO right now. But uh, going back to this question, we need to link foreign policy with home policy. The same government that has no money, pe people have no money to, to hit their homes uh, uh, here, uh, while the government is sending millions to this uh, war uh, in a faraway uh, country. This is a complete uh, scandal. The, the, the Russian Marxists' first task is to oppose their own government. This is a reactionary war on the part of uh, Putin, a reactionary imperialist war based on uh, great Russian uh, nationalism, which is one of the most reactionary ideologies there's ever been, it includes anti-Semitism and a whole number of other things. They, they should oppose this war. However, they need to take into account some other factors. That since this is a war between NATO and Russia, there are going to be many Russian workers who think who are not very happy with, with NATO interfering in, uh, in uh, Russia. So, the, so they need to be careful not to mix the banners with the banners of the bourgeois liberals in Russia who are also against the war, but they are in favor of uh, NATO. They, they like to have a pro-NATO government in, uh, in uh, Russia, so, so they need to be careful with that. And finally, this leaves us the question, which is the most complicated one. What's the position, of, what should be the position of Ukrainian Marxists, Ukrainian revolutionaries? And, uh, and here there's all sorts of confusion. In the same way, there's groups here in this country whose position is arms for Ukraine, sanctions on Russia. Why, why do you, I mean, why, uh, where, where, where do you even start uh, criticizing this? This is the position of Boris Johnson, sorry, Liz Truss, uh, I don't even know who's in power here. This is the position of Joe Biden. Why do you want, 
uh, why do you need a socialist group to adopt that uh, position? I mean, th this is complete capitulation to your own imperialism, but going back to, to Ukraine, there are groups that who call themselves socialists who in fact have adopted the position of Ukrainian nationalism, the worst possible position that you can uh, have. And I'd like to read, with the permission of the chair, a short uh, quote. What was the position that the Serbian Marxists, the Serbian socialists took in World War I? Remember that uh, Lenin said, the only part of this war, which is a genuine war of national defense, is on the Serbian side, he said. Because remember, well, it was the Serbians who killed the, the Archduke of, uh, Arch, how do you call it, Archduke uh, Ferdinand. But uh, in fact, this was a war of uh, Austro-Hungary, Austro-Hungarian Empire against Serbia. It invaded Serbia. And you could argue, as Lenin, Lenin said, that this is a war of national defense on the part of uh, Serbians. Everything else is an, inter is an imperialist war that we oppose, but we could consider giving support to the Serbian war of national liberation. Very similar situation. What did, what did the Serbian Marxists say? So in a letter, oh, in a letter to Rakovsky, one of the leaders of the Serbian Marxists said, for us, it was clear that as far as the conflict between Serbia and Austria-Hungary was concerned, our country was obviously in a defensive position. He says a few other things, and then he says, if, and if social democracy had the legitimate right to vote for war, they had members of parliament in the, in the Serbian parliament, anywhere, then certainly that was the case in Serbia above all. But he then says, however, however, for us, the decisive fact was that the war between Serbia and Austria was only a small part of a totality, merely the prologue to universal European war. And this latter, we were profoundly convinced of this, could not fail to have a clearly pronounced imperialist character. And as a result, we, being part of the great socialist proletarian international, considered that it was our bounden, bounden duty to oppose the war resolutely. We did not want to cause any dis... Uh, and, then, and then he makes an ironic point. So they opposed the war. They voted against the war credits in the Serbian parliament at a time when the country was being invaded by uh, Austro-Hungary and there was a, a strong nationalist uh, movement. They said, no, this is just a prelude of a, of, a, of a bigger international war. And remember that it was Russia that was using the national rights of the peoples in the Balkans to their own uh, advantage, Tsarist Russia, that, that is. And then he says in an ironic, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's ironic or not, but he says, it comes across that way. He says, as a result, oh, sorry, we did not want to cause any discord in the attitude of the sections of the international. And yet, it is precisely through our position, opposition to the war, that we have, contrary to our intentions, caused such discord. For alas, almost all of the other socialist parties have voted for this war. So imagine, they, they were in the position where it will have been at least some, somewhat justified to vote for war credits. And uh, then it was the, all the others, i.e. the Germans, the French, uh, the Belgians, all of the other socialist parties voted for, for the war, with, with very few exceptions. But then he says also something very interesting, which I think is relevant to Ukraine, he says, unfortunately, we were only too right. This war, th this letter was written in the spring of, uh, of 1915, letter to Rakovsky. He says, unfortunately, we were only too right. This war has destroyed Serbia. It will be an understatement to say that the country has been decimated. Half and the best half of our population has been destroyed. To losses in combat, we must add, must be added others, even greater, caused by typhoid fever, other epidemics, blah, blah, blah. What was the best and most valuable in Serbia no longer exists. And then he says, greater Serbia will have no Serbs. Now this phrase has become a popular saying amongst us. I.e., the idea of the Serbian bourgeois to create a greater Serbia, uh, which was their idea, which meant also territorial uh, uh, takeovers of other neighboring uh, countries, of course. Um, now this phrase has become a popular saying amongst us. Greater Serbia will have no Serbs. The national policy of the bourgeois in uh, Serbia will destroy the Serbian uh, people. Uh, and they were right. He says, the people are completely exhausted and all of them long for peace. The most, uh, they, they have experienced the most terrible disillusion about their own chauvinist uh, policies. 
So I think that this, this kind of gives us an indication what should be the policy of uh, Marxists in, in, uh, in Ukraine. Well, the Marxists in Ukraine must explain that it is the policy of Ukrainian reactionary nationalists that have been in power that has created, first of all, the division of Ukraine in 2014, which gave uh, a fertile ground for Russian, uh, for Russian intervention. So you can't sort any of this out without starting from that point of view. And their po policy should be, in order for there to be an independent, sovereign uh, Ukraine, first of all, we must overthrow the regime of the Ukrainian uh, oligarchs. And on that basis, and on that basis alone, we can then make an appeal to the Russian uh, workers to overthrow their own regime of the, of the oligarchs and settle matters between the two peoples in a, friendly, uh, in a friendly matter. Now, this might seem completely utopian at the present time. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has certainly, must have certainly pushed a lot of people in the hands of reactionary Ukrainian nationalism, even people who weren't that way inclined before. But as the war goes on and uh, Ukraine is battered and destroyed, some people will start to long for peace, as, as this letter says. Some people will start to say, was it worth? Why, why, what's the reason for this, uh, for this uh, war? Weren't these politicians completely irresponsible to divide Ukraine along national lines in the first uh, place? And should we, should we not put an end to, to this? Uh, and this is the policy, uh, and on this basis, is that the, the, the policy of the Ukrainian Marxists must, uh, must be developed. Thank you, and, and sorry for going over time.